How do you decide who is considered the best NASCAR driver for a year? That's a philosophical question that's been debated for over seven decades. Is it the person with the best average finish? The one who wins the most races? The most money? Or the person who can navigate through several playoff elimination rounds, numerous resets, and prevail in a winner-take-all final race? Between 1949 and 1967, points were awarded based on the amount of prize money in a race. In the 1949 season, lower-paying races would give the winner 50 points. Bigger races would net the winner 175. As prize money increased over the years, the points distribution was adjusted four times. In 1968, NASCAR switched to a system where points were related to mileage in a race. For races of less than 250 miles, the winner would get 50 points. For races between 250 and 400, the winner would get 100 points. And for races 400 miles or more, the winner would get 150. In 1972, Bill France Jr. took over as president of NASCAR. One of his first acts was to change the point system again to one related to the laps the driver completed. Race winners would get 100 points, with two points separating each position. At tracks under a mile in length, cars would get a quarter point for each lap ran. At mile tracks, they would get half a point per lap. At the 1.3 mile Darlington track, drivers would receive 7 tenths of a point per lap. That number increased until tracks of 2.5 miles that paid one and a quarter points per lap. In 1972, Bobby Allison won two more races and more money than Richard Petty, but finished second in points. Ideally, winners should get a bigger advantage, so a new formula was created for 1973 that paid 125 points to the winner, 98 points to second place, and two less points for each position behind. Plus, bonus points were given for each lap completed in the same way they were in 1972. This formula resulted in a very close battle for the championship, where five drivers entered the last race with a chance to win the title but it still allowed Benny Parsons to win the championship with only one win and only one lead lap finish, while Richard Petty won six races and the most money, but finished fifth in points because he completed 700 fewer laps than Parsons. So after one year, NASCAR created their most complicated points formula for 1974. The amount of money a driver won would be multiplied by the number of races started, and that number was divided by 1,000 to reach the points total. This formula resulted in very odd decimals and strange gaps between drivers. Richard Petty won the championship, while fourth place Bobby Allison trailed him by 3,018.555 points. Petty was clearly the best driver of 1974, but the system was overly complicated. By this point, Bill France Jr. couldn't figure out how to determine the best driver for a year in a simplified and honest manner. So after 1974, he turned to his friend Bob Latford, a high school classmate and longtime NASCAR employee who is currently the PR director for Atlanta Motor Speedway. Latford sat with friends at the Boot Hill Saloon in Daytona Beach and wrote a new point system on a napkin while drinking beer. They wanted the system to reflect consistent performance by a driver to determine the championship, not just uh, hanging in there. So we worked on a system to reward that consistency, also reward the people who put on the show during the race, who are the leaders. Since its inception in 1949, NASCAR has been an organization in constant change. Points have always been awarded in some form or another to determine the champion, but the system by which they are handed out has undergone many facelifts over the years. The search for the best way to distribute points has been a long one for NASCAR, in the past, systems were based on the number of laps run in a race, others by the amount of prize money offered. These methods made certain events more valuable than others, and the degree of consistency was low. So in 1974, NASCAR adopted a plan that has worked longer than any other. Presently, NASCAR and Winston distribute points in five parts. A driver finishing first in a race receives 175 points. The remaining drivers through fifth position take five points less for each spot. Positions six through ten have a difference of four points between them and a tenth place driver receiving 134 points. Then the gap between spots 11 through 44 is only three points. 
In a 40-car field, the driver finishing last receives a mere 43 points, a far cry from first place. Bonus points are also awarded to the drivers for leading a race. Five points are given to a driver for taking the lead once and five more if he can lead the most laps all day. A driver who can win and stay up front will receive a total of 185 points. Between 1975 and 1983, the champion was usually the driver with the most wins or close to it. But by 1984, the system was criticized for not rewarding wins enough. System critic Daryl Waltrip thinks winning races and leading the money earnings should spell championship. Well, if being number one in all categories doesn't make you the champion or the number one driver in the sport, then why keep score? All indications are the system will change. Latford has proposed two alternatives, each of which places greater rewards on winning. Uh, I think the sport itself predicates the need for a change. Under either of these plans, it gives a driver who's behind in the points toward the end of the year a way of catching up points by racing and not just stroking and depending upon the guy he's trying to catch falling out. Well, I can hear the boos all the way from Dover to Talladega, but I agree with Darrell Waltrip. The guy who wins the most races and the most money should be the championship. Ironically, while Darrell Waltrip led the series in wins in 84 but didn't win the championship, he would find himself in the exact opposite position a year later. In 1985, Darrell Waltrip won the Winston Cup championship by 101 points over Bill Elliott. Elliott won 11 races that year, Waltrip just three. But in the last seven races of the year, Waltrip had only one finish out of the top ten. Elliott finished outside the top ten five times. In 1988, the system was criticized again when Bill Elliott entered the final race with no incentive to run up front and still win the championship. He had done enough throughout the rest of the season. Well, by the time the Atlanta weekend was over, most of the local print reporters had joined the chorus of complaints from the garage area that Bill had stroked his way to the championship. For a reaction, here's Chris Economaki of National Speed Sport News. By now, everyone knows that Bill Elliott clinched this year's Winston Cup by playing a cool and comfortable in Sunday's Atlanta Journal 500, a course of action that has drawn widespread criticism. But those who criticize forget that Elliott's season was impressive, both in quality, behind the wheel, and from the speaker's platform. Elliott's driving has improved, as has his public presence. Rather than thrill a few fans with a Doss and Bill Dash to the front Sunday, of which I'm sure Bill and his car were more than capable, he played it cool and took the honor. So, Bill, don't listen to these criticisms. Take our congratulations and enjoy your championship year. And finally today for us, a reaction to the reaction to Bill Elliott's Winston Cup championship. Those who complain that Elliott stroked it and didn't try to win any late season races have forgotten the lessons of the year 1985. Back then, Bill figured win the races and the championship will take care of itself. Atlanta newspaper men might approve, but that philosophy has no connection with reality. The guy who wins the most races frequently does not claim the Winston Cup. And Rusty Wallace's gripe that he won just as many races as Bill this year must be mildly amusing to Elliott, who won 11 races in 1985 and lost the crown to a guy who won only three. Now, those Atlanta reporters are right about one thing. Charging is the more appealing way to win a championship. But those complaints should go to Daytona, not to Dawsonville. The culprit is not Bill Elliott. It's the Winston Cup point system, which encourages finishing, not taking chances. Bill Elliott didn't create the system that rewards strokers with championships. And if NASCAR really wants its would-be champions to charge, all it has to do is offer them a reward, give them a few bonus points for winning races. Ironically, Rusty Wallace entered the final race in 1989 in the same position as Elliott, and he too played it safe and won the championship with a conservative finish. While some people criticized, the point system was generally popular. In other professional sports, simply winning or losing is the bearing on the standings, but not so in Winston Cup racing. Now, this point system has been in existence for more than 15 years, and it rewards consistency. Certainly, a win along the way does help, but being there at the end of the race is what really counts. The Winston Cup point system, as complex as it may be, contributes greatly to the door handle to door handle, nose to tail action that we see in the premier stock car series in the world. To become the Winston Cup champion and collect the million dollar bonus that goes with it, you have to run up front, finish races, and master every unique track on the circuit. 
short tracks, super speedways, and road courses. I think our point system does very well. I don't think there's anything that we need to change about it. Uh, it it's just a system that, that attributes, it, it bonuses you if you are a hard charger and lead a bunch of laps. It bonuses if you should lead it all during the day, but it also lets a guy that is a consistent runner, if he can consistently finish in the top five, he'll lead the points like Dale Earnhardt has done this year. In 1990, the point system was called into question when Morgan Shepard led the points in June after putting together a NASCAR record 11 straight top 10 finishes to start the year. Dale Earnhardt, who had three wins compared to Shepard's zero, defended the point system, saying, quote, the system is about as close to being fair as it can get. Bill Elliott added that it was a lot harder to finish in the top 10 than it was 10 years prior, and that consistent performance should be rewarded for the achievement that it is. In the end, Earnhardt won the championship after leading the series with nine wins. In 1992, the point system had its greatest moment when six drivers entered the final race with a chance to win the title. There are fans rooting for their favorite driver as for the first time in NASCAR history, six drivers are eligible for the championship going into this event. The quest for the cup standing showed Davey Allison on top by 30 over Alan Kowicki, but also Bill Elliott, Harry Gant, and Kyle Petty are eligible. And then Mark Martin is the sixth driver mathematically capable of taking the championship here today. Bill Elliott comes off the fourth corner. Between 1993 and 1994, Rusty Wallace won nearly twice as many races as Dale Earnhardt, but trailed him both years by a wide margin. Even the creator of the system, Bob Latford, agreed that winners should get additional bonus points. In 1996, Jeff Gordon won 10 races, but lost the championship to Terry Labonte, who won only two. Labonte finished outside the top 30 only once that year, while Gordon did so six times. Dominant seasons by drivers between 1997 and 2001 meant that the championship battle wasn't a nail-biter like some years, but people were confident the right driver was winning the championship each year. By 2002, the point system was once again beloved by all. With seven races left in the year, there were eight drivers separated by less than 200 points. It was close, wide open, and ready for a driver to step up and win the championship, like Tony Stewart did by a margin of 38 points. On July 23, 2003, point system creator Bob Latford died at age 67. His passing came amid the biggest attack on his system yet. At the time, Matt Kenseth had a 234-point lead after 19 races. In the last 28 years, this was only the fifth time someone had that big of a lead by that point in the season. But at that moment, Kenseth had only one win and built his lead by scoring 15 top 10 finishes. By early August, NASCAR acknowledged the point system might be revoked for 2004, with anywhere from 10 to 50 extra points awarded to race winners. NASCAR chairman Bill France Jr. was in support of tweaking the points. Between May and October of 2003, Ryan Newman won seven races and climbed from 27th to 4th in points, but his wins came too late to be considered the year's best driver. Again, there was the same argument of consistency versus wins the same belief that the champion was taking it easy near the end of the year, having practically clinched the title with months left in the season. And now there was a day that more people despised than Mondays for most people. It was the dreaded Good Points Day. We're real proud of this effort, and it was a Good Points Day for us. It was a big point day for us, for sure. You know, it, it's turned out to be a Good Points Day for us. And even before the 2003 season began and Matt Kenseth ran away with the championship, there was the belief that there wasn't enough incentive for drivers to win. Jeff Gordon explained the most important thing was consistent finishes. That may keep drivers from being aggressive and chasing wins. In September of 2003, Brian France was named as NASCAR's new CEO. One day after NASCAR's banquet in New York, he met with executives to evaluate potential changes to the system. For 2004, race winners were given an extra five points, but most shockingly, NASCAR would move to a playoff system. The top ten in points would be reset for the final ten-race chase, a new era in deciding the champion. 
It's a radical change that has received mixed reviews, resistance from inside the garage, negative feedback from some fans, eager anticipation from others. Okay, I know some of you are still having trouble with the new chase for the championship. But you know, to me, it's kind of like making the move from vinyl to CD sound. Same great music, just in a different format with uh, more excitement at the end. Yeah, that's it. Here's how it's going to work. After the first 26 races, NASCAR is going to take the top 10 in points and they're going to raise them to an elite, unattainable level by these other guys. But then they're going to take any big lead or any deficit and they're going to shrink it down. These guys will be separated by only 50 points. That means if your guy at that point is the boss and he's way ahead, that lead is gone. That's going to make you mad. I'm sorry. But if your guy is maybe in the top 10 but way behind, he's going to get a lot closer. It's going to be rock and roll. And I think that's what we might expect in the last 10 races. Do you realize that we could have a different championship leader in those last 10 races, even going down to the final race in Miami? I think it's going to be great. But what about these other guys down here? Well, you know what? In the last 29 seasons, no driver outside the top 10 in the final 10 races has ever gone on to win the championship and they could win any or all of those last 10 races and take all the points that these guys are trying to get to win the championship. Talk about a twist. We'll see in November if this new chase for the championship turns out to be one of NASCAR's greatest hits. And let me ask you, do you like the system? Ah, age before beauty. Hey, uh, no, I, I, I don't like it. It's got holes in it. There's things I don't like. Doesn't reward the winners enough. You can still have a, a champion that would theoretically not win a race. I thought that's what we were trying to fix. Plus, I don't want them to take away all my points when we get to the 26 points. <laughs> all right, so we have, a great, we have a not really like you like? I like it, I like it a lot because it makes these guys uh, get up on the calm wheel. Down, calm the down, first down, race. Breath. It really is. It's, it's the deal where I think it's going to make it exciting. It makes these drivers get up there and get on the wheel right on the get-go. And fa let's face it, second race of the year, we're already talking about points. The inaugural chase for the championship proved a success, resulting in a banner year for the next Hell Cup series and its champion, Kurt Busch. Kurt Busch wouldn't have won the championship with a full season point system. Jeff Gordon would have instead won his fifth title. But the chase for the cup gave NASCAR a major boost in publicity, which was viewed as a major success at the time. Ratings for the 2004 season finale were up 47% over that in 2003. The chase continued unchanged until 2007 when they were expanded to 12 cars. This came in response to Jeff Gordon and Tony Stewart winning races in the chase despite missing the cut. But now critics said you only had to be good during the regular season, and great in the final 10 tracks. Jimmy Johnson won five straight championships based on his success at the final 10. In 2011, the points would be changed yet again. The fans have been clear, though, about one thing. They care about winning. They don't want a driver to just be content with a good point state or a good run. So here's what's new for 2011. First, we're going to make the point system simpler and easier to understand. Beginning this year, will award points in all NASCAR series by one point increments. Race winners will continue to get extra points for the win, and then everyone else is separated by one point. So a driver who gets 43 points plus three bonus points for winning a race, <coughs> winning the race and points and a point for leading a lap for a total of 47 points for the win. So a driver can earn another point by leading the most laps, consistent with uh, our, 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 our past history. We're also adjusting how drivers qualify for the chase for the NASCAR Sprint Cup. We will continue to have a 12-car field for the chase, but the final two qualifiers will earn a spot in the chase based on wins during the first 26 races. In 2011, the revamped point structure led to the first championship tie. Tony Stewart beat Carl Edwards in a tiebreaker based on wins. In 2014, an even more radical point system was introduced, one that involved elimination rounds and multiple resets. Here's how the new championship format for the NASCAR Sprint Cup Series will work. First, the chase grid, essentially our playoff bracket, will now expand to 16 drivers. Oh, like a bracket? Yeah, only it's a chase grid. It's the new playoff format. We start with the challenger round. The 16 drivers that make the chase for the NASCAR Spring Cup 
run three races. After Dover, four are eliminated. Eliminated? Kaput. They, they just can't win the championship. Whew. If you win one of the three races, you automatically advance. Points decide the rest of the spots, and if you don't win, you better be a front runner. Then, the second round. The contender round. 12 drivers, three races. After Talladega, four more are eliminated. Cuatro más? C. Ay, Dios mío. Then the third round. The eliminator round. Eliminator. Ooh. Eight drivers compete. Only four advance. The championship round at Miami. One race. Four drivers. All with an equal chance. Capiche? Wow. Okay. The first of the four to finish. Wins the chase for the NASCAR Spring Cup. Faux show. But one of the major faults of this playoff format was that after one round of elimination, all remaining drivers were reset to a tie. No matter what happened in the first 29 races, all 12 cars left were equal at race 30. In the years that followed, moments of extreme drama erupted as a result of the format. In 2014, Ryan Newman's last lap pass of Kyle Larson at Phoenix eliminated Jeff Gordon from a chance at the championship. In a system designed to reward drivers who win at certain times of the year, Newman finished second in points with no wins. In 2015, Matt Kenseth led the series with five wins going into the October 25th race at Talladega. Kenseth and Dale Earnhardt Jr. were eliminated in the cutoff race after Kevin Harvick caused a crash with two laps to go when it appeared he would be eliminated. Next week, Kenseth's crash with Joey Logano kept Logano from going for the championship despite having six wins. Kyle Busch won the title despite missing 30% of the races. In 2017, the point structure was changed once more. 2017 is a new era in NASCAR. Each race will feature three stages. Championship points will be awarded to each of the top 10 finishers of the stage. And to the stage winner, if they make the playoffs, an additional bonus point will be tacked on for the first three rounds. When the checkered flag flies, the race is over. And championship points will be awarded to all race vehicles. And to the winner goes the biggest prize, a spot in the playoffs, and five postseason bonus points that will be carried through the round of eight. The stage wins and playoff points would now roll over through each playoff round to give a new advantage to drivers for the regular season wins. But like all championship formats in the past, drivers have exposed holes in it. In 2018, Kyle Busch and Kevin Harvick won eight races each, but both lost the championship to Joey Logano, who won only three. In 2019, Matt Crafton won the Truck Series title without any wins. And in 2020, Kevin Harvick's nine wins didn't help him avoid elimination before the championship race. And Harvick is going to be out of the playoffs. Every point system throughout NASCAR's history has been criticized when drivers exploit its purpose. The current one is no exception. What it takes to be considered the best driver of the year will always be debated. As long as champions have been decided, people have always said there could be a better way.